Well, good evening and welcome to the Figgy Art Museum's Virtual Thursdays at the Figgy series. My name is Melissa Moore and I'm Director of Education at the Figgy and I'm happy you could join us tonight. For the time being, we're hosting programs nearly every Thursday evening, so please be sure to check the Figgy's website for topics and to register. And we're able to offer these programs at no cost to you, thanks to the generous sponsorship provided by Chris and Mary Rayburn. Chris and Mary, thank you so very much for that. While these programs are free to watch, I do encourage you to consider becoming a Figgy member. Your membership helps us continue to fulfill our mission of bringing art and people together, even when we aren't together in person. A quick note about tonight, if you have any questions during the program, please enter them into the Q&A at any time and we'll get to them as we can. So at this time, it's my pleasure to turn things over to the Figgy's assistant curator, Vanessa Sage. Vanessa, thank you for joining us tonight to introduce tonight's program. Thank you, and thank you very much, Tom, for agreeing to participate in this program. Uh, so it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker this evening, the esteemed artist, Tom Utek. His work has been the subject of over 35 one-person exhibitions and is represented in the museum collections of Crystal Bridges Museum of Art, the Milwaukee Art Museum, the Philbrook Museum of Art, of course, the Figgy, and this is just to name a few. Uh, this event is planned in conjunction with the exhibition, Tom Utek Origin on view in the Lewis Gallery at the Figgy Art Museum through August 15. It comprises of 10 large format black and white photographs taken during the late 70s and early 80s, and the beloved painting from the Figgy collection, Kizzy Bakwad. The exhibition reflects Tom's enduring fascination with the wilderness, specifically the forests and the lakes of Northern Wisconsin, Minnesota, and Quetico Provincial Park in Ontario. He was born and raised in Wisconsin and nature has played a consistent and important role throughout his life as a dedicated bird watcher, conservationist, hiker, painter, and photographer. He completed his studies at Leighton School of Art and the University of Cincinnati, and he was a professor of art at the University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee until 1998. Uh, through his work, Tom offers viewers new ways to experience and appreciate the world around us. And we at the Figgy are very fortunate to be able to share his work with the community through this exhibition. And we're very grateful for the opportunity. I would like to take a moment to thank the sponsors of the exhibition, GoGo Enterprises, and to mention that if you have questions for Tom, please place them in the chat and I will pose them uh, to him. And now I'm very happy to turn it over to Tom Mutek. Hello. Uh this is going to be very interesting. I've never done something like this before. And um, bear with me because it might get a little bit confusing. Uh, as you can, I guess we should go to the first picture. All right. Um, that's not the one I expected, but it's OK. Um, this is a painting which was done, I see, in 1996, which is um, kind of characteristic of the work that I have been doing for quite a few years. And it is about the um, uh, the way I react to being um, alone, far out in the wilderness um, on the lake country up in Canada, um, which is a very, very interesting, interesting and moving and emotional place, uh, especially at dawn and dusk. One of which this these two this painting is, I don't know which. Um, on a still night, still morning. Uh, and yet is character, it, the painting is also characteristic of a lot of aspects of that landscape. Um, not only the um, vast lakescapes and the uh, color of the light, but also the trees, the type of the trees and the rocks and the bare um, rock shorelines sometime. Um, this painting, 96, would have been 16 years or so after the uh, photographs that are in this uh, show. And an interesting thing about the whole situation with these <clears throat> is that I was doing different kinds of paintings um, early in this process. And uh, Vanessa, could you go to the uh, painting with the orange uh, moon? Or no, go right, well, that was pretty fast. 
Um, go back to the first landscape at the top. There, yeah, the next, the next picture, right there. Um, this is a view of part of that kind of landscape in a more um, uh, objective way, and it's not been altered very much and um, messed around with like I can do on a canvas. And it d d describes a whole lot of the interesting emotional feeling of that kind of a time of the day. Um, and it's very it was very mysterious and exciting and sometimes almost scary. And parts of it, parts of that experience seemed magical in a way that uh, defied description or ordinary experience. And as a first attempt to um, do something with that, now please go to the orange moon painting. Um, I started doing paintings that had a lot of metaphorical variations in them and sort of magical uh, events that were hopefully um, going to be able to generate the same kind of a uh, of a response to the landscape that I had and I hoped other people would have. So in this painting, we see something like that vast swamp, marsh, sedge meadow that that photograph just had and a large uh, checkered or, or angular pond right behind the figures in the front. And then a bunch of trees that have uh, cut loose from the ground and in this magic night are floating around dancing in the space. Uh, and all of these trees are incomplete trees covered with moss, black moss, which uh, is a exaggeration of things that I could see in the in the park, in the, in the woods. I was very interested in, as a, another way of dealing with that magic, would be to be making bimorphic um, imagery, which I didn't know it at the time, was had a lot of connections to um, real ancient kinds of imageries and stories. I was reading the um, Kalavala, the accumulation of Finnish folk stories, uh, which uh, included a lot of magic events and included the importance of um, being able to um, sing a, oh, a, a spell. <clears throat> um, and a lot of these things included creatures that had more than just human forms. They'd be spirits that uh, could take a human form. And so I started making this uh, image of a, of a, a woman that had a deer head uh, with uh, antlers. So it would have been a, a, obviously a woman and then a um, male deer head so that it would be a creature that was uh, both uh, genders at the same time. And I used that, that image in a number of ways in a number of paintings. In this one, I also incorporated that image, that, that creature as part of a plant. And there is a kind of a plant, it's a carnivorous plant that grows in these bogs in the north. It's called a pitcher plant. And it looks more or less like these three things that uh, this uh, creature is enclosed inside of. The pitcher plants have um, aromas that attract insects. And the insects that come to them to find out what's going on in this plant find themselves on a portion of the inside of it with spiny hairs pointing downward. And it's very hard for them to climb back out. And so most of them end up in the bottom where there's a pool of water which has digestive juices that uh, pro provides the um, some of the nutrition that the plant needs that the uh, acetic bogs cannot provide. 
So this creature is inside of their part of that plant and it is in the process of attracting black moths flying around. And some of them have landed on it and I painted them so that they'd be gradually becoming absorbed into the color of the creature's skin. So this thing is not only um, uh, uh, bisexual, I guess you could say, but also by species. Well, you know, by species, because it's also part plant. Um, that was a way of trying to allude to the stuff that was uh, exciting me about the uh, various characteristics of the Northwoods. We could go back to that first uh, landscape now then. Now, this uh, image was made, this particular one was made a few years after that painting we just looked at. And during the same time I was using, making those paintings uh, and trying to use this uh, fictitious imagery as a way of alluding to the uh, characteristics and the emotional feelings of being in that landscape, I was in the process of shooting thousands of negatives on many trips into the woods, often two or three times a year. Uh, and trying to find a way to, in those photographs, reveal some of that mystery. The photographs in the show are all digitally printed, and they are, I believe, all very large, which is a very confusing proposition to me. Because things like this particular image, I really like as a small 8 by 10 thing that you can hold in your hands, and uh, I think your imagination fills in the space. There is, however, something really interesting that happens when they're enlarged this large, and that's that they take out a gravity that uh, a small thing in your hand quite, can't quite have. And I don't know if that's altogether good at all times, but it's a characteristic of them. Um, can we go to the next landscape? All right. One of the things that is in that, let me see, when was this? This is 1977, so it's very close to the first painting that I showed you. One of the things that happens up there is that mature spruce forest can um, grow in very in a, inhospitable um, environments. This land that you're looking at right now is all covered, it's mossy, soft as can be when you walk through it. You can lay down it and think you're in a very, very comfortable um, mattress until all the water that's underneath soaks through and you get really soaking wet. Um, so it, it has a beauty of being very soft and inviting and a reality that's in many ways different. This moss is growing entirely on bedrock. That's only just a few inches below the moss. And these trees somehow are uh, growing in that kind of a wet environment, which black spruce like to do or can do, and a lot of other things can't. And uh, they somehow find a way to um, have the roots uh, produce nutrition in this, out of this inhospitable and, and um, there's this rock underneath it that does not allow roots to penetrate very deep and so forth. As a result, the roots are often very pancake shaped and they spread out sideways at great distances. And in certain kind of conditions, heavy snow in the winter or windstorms, the whole tree can topple over and it will uh, leave a thing which we call tip ups. So you see the whole root bump mass hey, you know, sticking up in the air. Uh, with the tree trunk attached to it yet. What we see in the middle of this uh, photograph is a, one of these leftover um, tip-ups and it uh, has mostly deteriorated, but what, what we see now is the outlines of part of it and a hole in the middle that, um, let me see if I can control this now. All right, right there. Oh, good. I've learned how to do this. This. Um, it goes all the way down to the bedrock uh, and it's all water underneath it and so forth. Um, 
I thought when I saw that, that that was some kind of a, um, like a, uh, an opening to some uh, underground, um, almost like in, you know, in, the, in an old rune story or something like that. And it looked to me like it was more than just a geological feature, but that something was something that also uh, could move on and, and become part of a story. So this thing was composed in such a way to reveal not only the open characteristics of the landscape and have a design that in one way or another um, worked as a design and then featured this mysterious, um, it's like a volcano opening or something like that crazy that's going on in Iceland right now, uh, where, you know, Elements from the underworld can come out and inhabit the landscape. Um, I don't know how, I, I imagine that there's not a single person watching this that would have thought of that until I just said it, but um, uh, th that's sort of what I was thinking of in the thing. Um, and that would be an expansion of, instead of just only just trying to find a way to, in describing the landscape, to get at the kind of a mystery that I was interested in, but also to start to control it a little bit uh, and uh, tell more of a story by an intention. Let's go to the next uh, landscape. <clears throat> Another characteristic of that uh, place then is that it was uh, buried in gigantic glaciers years ago, 10,000, who receded 10,000 years ago. And they uh, basically scraped the landscape clear and there are places where there's whole hillsides that are solid granite and greenstone and whatnot, all uh, geological forms that are still not able to support uh, vegetation. And then scattered among them are things like these. Um, let me see if I have to, like, oops. All right, I'm doing something funny. Let's, can we get back to the big rock? <laughs> I don't know. All right, so keep going back there. Um, so maybe, okay, I hope you can see the white arrow. So there are these big rocks that are called glacial erratics that were dropped by the glacier. This rock that the arrow is on right here on the left is probably 10 or 12 feet tall. And it's now covered in lichens and it just sits or bounds precariously on the downslope of one of these uh, open rock uh, um, formations. They seem to me to be like creatures all into themselves and they're so unusual that you, um, they don't look like rocks, they look like beings. And that kind of a uh, image I hoped um, I could use, in a painting, and I, no, I, I didn't mean to say that. That's not quite the way I meant it. I tried to find a way in these things to photograph them so that they would um, look that uh, imposing and alive as I felt they were. And in the paintings, I found ways to try to carry that even farther. Now, if we could go back to the very first painting that you showed, the, the original landscape, you can see how in that landscape I started to um, be, and this painting a few years later, I was able to take those images that I remembered and, and, and had photographed uh, and try to make them come alive and inhabit that landscape as if they were as active and could speak to us the same way the wolves could howl at us that are also in this painting. And on the rocks, I painted lichens. Let me see if I can get, all right, like right here, that would grow on the rock in life and created in such a way so that it would look like as if it is a, a living being also, um, only that it's you know, described yeah, right like this. Um, so it's sort of a, a referral back to that kind of a uh, idea. Let's go back to the other painting again, please. The one we just looked at, all right. Um, so there are a lot of things in the rocks, in these paintings that I tried to make have that characteristic 
like the splits in the, in the rock here, that they would look more than just a des descriptive. Okay, let's go back to the photographs. And let's go to the next one and the next one. All right, now let's see where we are. Go to the next, the next image. All right, so we're back to that painting. And um, you can see, yeah, let's stay there for a second. You can see how the effort to achieve this was something that I had attempted to do in the photographs alone. Go on to the next painting, please. The brought that one. That's another variation on this idea of a uh, of a mythical uh, description of these kinds of uh, creatures and this kind of a landscape. Um, waterfall and a hillside with covered with moss, like in the first photograph, um, under very strange light. And on a hillside, those that kind of a moss can start to to sort of slide down the, the rock like waves, also like the volcano's uh, lava. So that's what's happening behind the uh, waterfall here and also spread throughout the landscape are all of these a little, let me see if I can get this going right here, a, uh, a cut off tree such and like this is one that's not totally finished yet that the beavers have cut off. Um, just trying to put a whole lot of stuff into the painting. And once again, it's much more metaphorical than the uh, when the paintings became. All right, let's go to the next slide, the next landscape in the order. All right, um, here we go back to the uh, mossy woods, like the one with the slit in the ground. And um, that's okay, stay, stay in the, the one that we just arrived at. Go to, keep right there. We'll stay in that one for a few minutes. In this, <laughs> am I doing that? All right. In this painting, in this photograph, there's aspects of this rock that I have um, identified as being, you know, having this life that I've just been speaking about. And in the process of digitalizing these negatives, I was able to use um, Photoshop to create stuff. And the way I did that was about the same thing as I could have done in a dark room by burning and dodging. In other words, adding more light or subtracting light that's hitting the, the photographic paper. Um, only it's far more easy than inviting a person to uh, play around and do other kinds of things that you would never even attempt in a dark room. On this rock that we were talking about, there, I, I saw, I hope that you're seeing this, this shape in the bottom part of it that sort of looks like a mouth. And then there's a form here that's a little bit nose-like and then eye-like shapes. Um, so the whole thing is a bit like a head. And that is not totally obvious. But I did that, I, I, I changed that. I must be doing something to these images every once in a while. Let me take this, take that off, see if that helps. I would do that in order to, if I see this kind of a thing in the, in the rock or any place else, like the moss on the ground, try to make it so that it was almost like as if it's an illustration of a thing, of a being, but never go so far and, and so that it's real obvious and make it real corny. Um, in most of these uh, photographs, you're going to see a bunch of that kind of a stuff. And um, when I looked at this one in preparation for this presentation, I found a lot of things that I would like to um, change. And I think it might be interesting to hear somebody talking about what they'd like to change instead of talking about what's in, a, in something already. Now, one of the things that this photograph has that I generally really dislike is, I'm going to go back to here. The this um, log shape and this one form an arrow that uh, leads you right straight off of the picture. Now I did something here that's made it. Okay, I'm back. So that's sort of like an arrow leading out of the picture, and it's very nervous and disruptive of the whole thing. And I'm not too sure that it's a good thing. So it'd be very interesting, I think, to try to correct that. 
a way to correct it would be to emphasize this angle formed by these rocks, I mean, by these logs, so that they more evenly compete with this triangle leading off the picture. And I hope that that you're seeing. Um, another way would be to take the, the white moss in the, in the bottom of the triangle that's leading off the picture and make it darker so that your eye would um, come and in, in circle around the moss instead of um, leading straight off the picture. Uh, and also I could take this area of moss and make it a little bit darker all the way to here. Let's go back, please. I don't know what's happening. All right, all the way to about there and thereby emphasize this light space and make it have more of a characteristic and maybe look like some kind of a creature, which I could play around with the same way as I did this rock and um, maybe make it something that competes with the triangle leading off the picture. Um, this, this triangle here that I was talking about could be emphasized more by darkening the shadow here on the moss of this tree that has landed there and stayed there for a while. The moss is growing over it, which is kind of a magical thing. And making, probably just making it darker, which would fill that all in. And another way, if I wanted to be even uh, more untraditional, I could take something like this tree and clone it and make it come down, let's say to right about here at the tip of the small one and go straight up and down here. And it would neutralize this triangle that goes off in the right corner. Um, if I live to be 112 and I'm able to do it, I'll probably play with this one some more on the computer and see what happens. Okay, let's go to the next picture, the next image. Here's that same rock that was in the previous big one that I was just uh, had talked to you about. And it's just a clearer view of it. In this photograph, I tried to just make it be a great big bugger standing there, challenging myself as the viewer and are you as the viewers. Um, it's, it would be a confrontation the same way as um, if I, in the newer paintings, if I put it, have something like a bear standing there looking at the viewer, that this rock would be like that, staring right at you and um, confronting you. In these photographs, I was not trying to make them be something that would uh, be information for the paintings that just happened by coincidence. I tried to, let's, can you go back to the big rock? I tried to um, make them be as good at, for, as a, an image of art as I possibly could. And it was extremely difficult because I couldn't control everything the way I can control uh, by drawing and painting on a painting. So it's a very, very hard job. And um, it led, it created, one of the problems it created is that the photographs could look way too, um, too, 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 I don't know, ordinary or, or cute or something like you see in the calendar. Um, not a very good calendar, by the way. <laughs> and I learned after a while to stop looking at the subject matter like this rock and try to find a way to metaphorically see the whole landscape as a uh, complete unit and to try to talk about the interconnectedness of a lot of things in life on the planet and actually in the cosmos. So let's go to the next slide. The next, the next, uh, all right, let's go past that. All right, here we go. Now there are, this is, I think these are the last four pay, uh, photographs of the show. And they are all ones that were create, that were made with an attitude of not looking at the landscape to see the landscape, but instead looking into the viewfinder of my Rolleiflex and trying to 
move it around until I felt, literally, I mean that, felt a wholeness to the product that was inside of the screen, rather than thinking about the picture I was taking. Um, and that I hoped would be something that would, instead of, that, I hope that would be something that start to allude to uh, the unity of all the forms and all the life, all the visual forms and all the life forms. And if you look at things like um, astronomical photographs of the Milky Way or out into our uh, galaxy, you'll see all sorts of similarities between these kind of a shapes and the way they swirl around. And uh, some of them are positive, some of them are negative and so forth. And if you look at a microscope at uh, cells in the human body, they also have a lot of the same characteristics. If you look at the foam on the river below a waterfall, it takes on the same kinds of shapes, very much looking like something that could be out there in the stars. So this is one photograph where that was attempted using the trees and the light and the rocks and the moss and the ground and so forth. If I could have found birds flying through it or bear standing there, I would have done it, but that didn't happen. Let's go to the next landscape, the next photograph. Here's another variation on that kind of a thing. In this case, I was walking near the same spot, um, which no, it was not at all near, it was altogether different anyway. Um, and I was seeing these trees that had fallen over and there, a lot of the branches were covered with unsnia mosses, also called old man's beard, that was real pale greenish gray that hung and draped. They're almost like Spanish moss in the south. And um, through the viewfinder, I was able to see this composition that was not in any way pictorial, um, but was something composed of, a, of this kind of a cosmic unity. And um, so therefore the photograph was shot. Um, and that I recognize is a very tough thing for a lot of viewers to look at and say, oh yeah, I understand that. Because it's not something that we're used to seeing in photography or expect or probably understand when you see it. But this is one that I, this is one image that I like very much in this show. And it's, you know, it's quite abstract, but it was not shot with the way a lot of photographers like to call, you know, as an abstract. Um, it has a lot of characteristics of, of the way of using space and shapes that the abstract expressions painters used, but that was not an intentional similarity. It's only a, it's, the only purpose here is to try to find a way to allude to the unity of all these forms. Let's go to the next uh, landscape. Now that same kind of a um, effort went into this one, uh, which is altogether a different uh, kind of a view. So we had one of the forest interior, then we had one of these uh, scattered branches and, and moss all over the place. But if I looked at the, at the rock beneath my feet, uh, along lake shores, um, it would be also something like this that would almost look like it was taken through uh, the Hubble te Space Telescope. And it's so fascinating because of the kinds of shapes that swirl all over the place and uh, create a, um, a picture of the same kind of a, I hope the same kind of a unity. Neat thing about this is that you can see that this is all solid rock and you can see how it's swirled and curled and bent. And, uh, that, that's all evidence of volcanic action millions of years ago. And so therefore, just like you look through the um, photographs out in space through the Hubble telescope, you're, and you're looking back into time, we're actually standing here on that rock, looking at it as we are right here, right now, but we're looking back into time and seeing something that happened geologically way before us. And so we're seeing the past and the present at the same time. Uh, I like that a lot. And that's similar, but not at all the same as what the first two um, things in this series um, had. Uh, 
So then the next one is another version of that. If we go to that slide, please. <laughs> these aren't slides, these are <laughs> Vanessa. To the next, the next photograph. Uh, there we go. Here's another thing similar to go back, please, to the to the rock. All right. This is also something shot. This is on the side of a of a cliff. Instead of looking down at the ground, and it's also consists of various for, forms of mineralization in the geology that were created by this formation of the Earth's crust and the volcanic, excuse me, and the glacial erosions of that over time. And one of the things I liked about this picture a lot is now I'm going to see if I can bring the arrow to the inside again without messing things up. And I'm, let me see if I click it. All right, there it is. There's this thing here, this white spot, which is probably, um, oh, I forget what we call that now. It's a mineral. It is a, a quartz. And it probably is a quartz vein that goes deep into the rock. And this is a part of it that's just been exposed by the glaciers. When I looked at that, I start to see something that looks like a creature with a, uh, like maybe a winged creature or somebody wearing a robe. And it's a two headed creature. These are arms, there's a body, and there's a couple heads. This head, particularly with eyes and mouth, and it it becomes animated to me, and I hope to you, in the same way as that uh, creature in the picture plant was. And so in this photograph, I uh, hope to be able to move beyond description and start to allude to a lot of this other kind of mystery stuff. And let's see, let's, let's go to the next, the next image, which I think is the um, your painting. No, no, okay, this one, is the last um, uh, landscape photograph in, the, in this presentation. And once in a while, when working along, just like uh, working through the woods, just like finding that kind of a quartz, possibly, you know, spiritual figure in the rock, sometimes things like this upturned root uh, start to become real animated looking. And they're almost like things that you could start dancing around and doing some kind of a mysterious, you know, rite of spring type of a dance or something like that. And um, with all sorts of, uh, if, I, if, if I do this, okay, you know, these root forms that are like wildly flailing arms and the whole torso is bending and, you know, another arm. And it's a thing that occupies the space um, and animates it in a way that's just not pictorial and pretty, but alludes to uh, some kind of a um, animated activity uh, within the landscape, made out of a landscape that we as people can look at and, uh, and imagine and uh, metaphorically turn into something else, whatever we wanted to. Now let's go to the, la to the uh, painting. And uh, this is the one that the figgy owns. And there's a lot of ways that in this painting, um, that kind of an animated root or tree form occurred. Um, there's the uh, curved branches, which are a tree trunks, I could say, which actually happen. And they're formed by um, snow accumulating on a young tree over the years, gradually bending it to the point where it never can straighten out. So this whole um, rocky, cluttered space, which is very much like what the woods can be like, um, is filled with these flailing and wailing and dancing uh, trees that have been affected by Kali snow, um, including something like this big one here in the front to the bottom moves around. I, I look at that thing as being alive and capable of movement movement the same way as I did in the a photograph we just looked at. Um, and only with this case, I can control where everything goes and add color to it and get away with it. So um, that um, is, I don't know where we're at now, but that's the end of the, uh, the images that I have to talk about. And if you have questions, um, please uh, submit them because I'd really prefer to, uh, 
make a presentation like this follow what you're interested in rather than me just rambling on. And um, this is all new to me, so I don't know where we are in the process here. Uh, somebody can maybe jump in and tell me. Um, Hi. So there we go. Good. Hi. Hi. <laughs> so we've got Thank a couple. You. Of course. Yeah, we've got a couple questions. Uh, so I think let's see. We can go ahead and start with that. So one question from Linda Lewis is, would you characterize your work as magic realism? I, I wouldn't because um, that is a, a, a descriptive style, uh, phrase that describes a specific style, which includes uh, a number of kinds of events and compositional arrangements that are somewhat um, contextualized according to the style itself. Um, and the motivation for that in the beginning, I'm sure was something very similar to what I'm doing, but magic realism as a thing has become a recognized style that um, if you don't file that exact style, you're not exactly doing magic realism. Uh, there are other kinds of uh, uh, image making that I feel more comfortable with. And that would be things like Hieronymus Bosch's wild, mysterious images of um, uh, people in hell and all that kind of a crazy stuff, or some of the uh, Bruegel paintings back from there. Um, let me see what else. There are a whole lot of re real early um, Renaissance and Gothic paintings that had back to Gothic paintings that had mysterious creatures. Uh, Matthias Grunewald has got in this that great big altarpiece has got these bizarre creatures running around that are meant, I guess, to be devils or something. And I feel much more um, compatible with that kind of a combination of images and spaces and events that are happening than what occurs in magic realism. Okay. So the next yeah. question is, thank you, Tom. So the next yeah. question is, can you speak a little bit more about the birds in your paintings? <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. There's the, that's not in the show very much, but it's a, a thing that's become um, unavoidable in the last few years. Uh, I don't know how much time you got, but I'll start telling the story, and you can just cut me off if it goes on too long. I had a painting one time that was one of these Northwoods landscapes and it was looking kind of boring. And I didn't know what the heck to do with it. I, I was very disappointed with myself. And I thought, well, if it's boring, it's not interesting. And one of the things that painting is, or any artwork has got to have is, is a lot of interest. So I thought, well, it would be more interesting if there would be five or six wolves running through it, probably. And I put them in and sure enough, they were, it, it was. And then I decided, well, if there was 10 wolves, it would probably be even more interesting. So I added more. Then I decided, well, if there are a bunch of bears running through it, that would make it even more interesting. Just keep adding interest on interest. And uh, then, well, you know, they can't all be things running across the landscape. So I started adding birds. And uh, that became fascinating. And it became something that transcended just making a painting more interesting turned it into something that seemed to have an allusion to some event or to something that was going on. And um, for some reason, they all are going from right to left, which wasn't an intentional meeting at the beginning, but uh, stayed. Uh, there was a Chinese poet by the name of John Yao who wrote a catalog uh, essay for one of my shows who said in, in Chinese culture often, the right side of a picture represents the future and the left side represents the past. Um, so maybe that's part of it, I don't know. But it, I want to allude to two things. One of them is the fecundity and busyness and fullness of nature. And the other is to indicate something or other about something going on that we can't understand. And that I hope you would then cause people to um, become interested in that and learn more about it and then discover all the terrible things that are happening and hopefully then go on and try to do something about it. 
Um, these things have become so, so interesting to me and I just can't stop painting them now. And um, that's just the way things go. Oh, <laughs> you, you follow the painting sometimes, you don't lead it. That's, that's the answer to that, I hope. Okay. Yep. Yeah. So here is a question uh, from Alan. So it says some of your photos are so busy and full that they seem to relegate the observer or the viewer to a position of like insignificance in front in the in the face of those uh, the compositions. And did you intend for that to be the case? Whoever that is, is a very smart observer. <laughs> I, I do want the viewer to feel like they are um, not the center of attention and to almost be like a pair of spiritual eyes floating around experiencing the landscape um, uh, rather than a physical being that's there talking to a friend that's walking with them and making all sorts of noise and uh, throwing trash on the ground and uh, ignoring Everything else, uh, you know, I, I like the, I like the viewer not to be the center of, atta of attention. I like that question. <laughs> All right, rescue me. <laughs> I'm coming. So uh, the next question we have is, were all of your photographs that you shot in black and white or did you also shoot them in color uh, or do, do you prefer black and white over color? I think is basically the question. Yeah, that's a that's an interesting and tough question. I did shoot some in uh, in color, um, uh, in the two and a quarter format with my Roliflex, and just about all of them are awful, and they're just <laughs> really not interesting at all. The color is a distraction. I shot a lot of thirty-five millimeter images that to me were um, in color on slide film that just looked too pictorial. And so they are just things that I've ended up looking at to enjoy the landscape as I remember it. Um, with Photoshop, I'm discovering how easy it is to turn them into black and white images. And as soon as you do it, that, they look more interesting. So I think there's something about a black and white image that reveals a mystery that the viewer, uh, uh, well, uh, complete and a color image uh, probably refers too many, too much to all the bad calendars we've seen and, and posters at airports and things that it kind of diminishes itself. But there is a lot of really good people trying to do good color photography. So that, I don't know, that's, that wasn't for me, but I wish them the best. Yeah. Whoops. Okay, there you go. So I think there's just, uh, let me see, there was one more question for you and then I think this is gonna be the last one, okay? All right. So you paint, uh, the frames that are on your paintings have paintings, uh, you know, uh, animals or plants and things on them. And uh, they were wondering what the relationship is between the things that you often paint on the frames and the paintings themselves. Oh, that's another nice question. I appreciate that. Um, in these earlier paintings that were very metaphorical and uh, biomorphic and all sorts of crazy stuff like that, there's a lot of crazy stuff in the painting. And uh, so those frames are real simple strip frames. In time, as the paintings became more normal looking, you know, more descriptive looking, and I attempted to use, um, oh, I don't know, just imaginative ways of treating the, the, the forms and uh, alluding to the same kind of a magic. Um, I discovered that I could only go so far and also it would become a real crazy, yeah, magic realist painting. And, but it seemed that uh, if I were to take a large frame instead of these simple strip frames and think back about things that I had, I had seen like um, Scandinavian rose mauling on furniture and so forth, which is so damn beautiful. 
if I took that and on the frame started putting stuff, that it would be a way to tell a story that complicates the story that the painting can't tell if it wants to be somewhat realistic. Uh, and so there's actually two stories going on in the paintings at the same time. And the uh, frames are painted, oh, like when the paintings are about 80% done, I put the frame on it and then work on them, both of them together and try to get the frame to slip around and add a uh, craziness to the image that I can't feel comfortable putting into the landscape itself. That's that. <laughs> well, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. And I think I'll turn it over to Melissa now so she can wrap up. Tom, that was wonderful. Thank you so much. I know we weren't sure in the beginning if we'd be able to host you for a program. Um, we had even talked about coming up there, you coming down here, and it just, things got tough this year, but we're so, grateful and appreciative of your time and sharing your passion and your talent with us this evening. So thank you for that from all of us. Well, I appreciate the opportunity. It was a lot of fun to learn how to do something new. <laughs> it's kind of rocky sometimes. What the heck? It's the way it is. <laughs> yep. I feel like we're all in that boat together. So thanks for well, joining us there. And it went you really did a better well. job than I did though, because you've done it before. But. You know what? I think that for Vanessa and me, this is, um, it was a year ago when we started doing these and it's been a really fun ride. I, you know, yep. I'm, I'm proud of every single program we're able to put out there. And I know many of our audience members tonight have been with us for almost every single one of those programs. So it's thanks wonderful. For, yeah. Thanks to our okay. audience too. So speaking of our audience, um, thank you for joining us tonight. We're going to continue to do some of the programs in person, some of them virtually, some of them we were able to simultaneously live stream from an in-person program. So just keep, keep checking the website for those upcoming programs and what those formats are. If you are listening to this program right now, you have my email address. I'm the one who emailed you the link for tonight. So if you ever have any questions or need any help with anything and signing up, please let me know. I wanna thank Vanessa for setting up this program and working with Tom. And Tom, you get the biggest thank you once again for joining us tonight. We really appreciate it and we look forward to being in touch. A reminder to our audience members, if you wanna go down and see Origin, which I know you, all of you want to if you haven't already, those of you who have been will be revisiting it often, no doubt. That is gonna be on view in the Lewis Gallery on level two through August 15th of this year. So make sure to keep that date in mind and get that get down there to see it and off. All right, with that, I'm going to say thank you and good night. We appreciate um, our, our guest presenter tonight, our curator of the exhibition, and you, our audience members, and we look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you.